Adventures by Morse. Carlton E. Morse presents... Dead Men Prowl, featuring Captain Friday. If you like high adventure, come with me. If you like the stealth of intrigue, come with me. If you like blood and thunder, come with me. Two days ago, Captain Bart Friday and his friend and guest, Dr. Croft, arrived in the little resort village of Holman across the bay from San Francisco. They had intended spending a quiet weekend at Captain Friday's summer cottage, but they had no sooner arrived in the village when things began to happen. On the beach, they stumbled on the dead body of old Doc Sims. They found Andrew Waters, the other wealthy man of the village, dead by hanging. Then they found the half-wit Hartley boy shot through the heart. The weird part of the whole thing is the fact that these three dead are apparently prowling the streets and houses of the town of Holman. That right, Captain Friday? Yes, that's right. I've tried everything. Handcuffed them, tied them down, even stuffed the three bodies in the refrigeration room at the morgue. But it didn't do any good. They're still prowling. The only thing I know for certain is that Doc Sims and Andrew Waters are brothers. Waters had been masquerading under an assumed name. The half-wit Hartley boy had been accidentally shot by Andres Ruiz. I've smoked out that much. Plus the fact that our other guests, Andres and Carmel Ruiz, and Gail and Martin Stanley, are related. But this latest development has just about got me stumped. Carmel Ruiz has disappeared. Yes, Carmel Ruiz has disappeared. The prowling dead have taken the little cousin of Andres. Death stalks in Holman. While Dr. Jamie Croft lay bound and gagged in Captain Friday's cottage, and while the Captain and Andres were racing along the coast of the Pacific to bring back the runaway Martin and Gail Stanley, brother and sister, one of the prowling dead had somehow escaped from the ruins of the morgue. He escaped from the ruins to stalk into the rear window of the cottage and kidnap the sleeping Carmel. And the dead thing who did this was the strangled body of our own uncle, Andrew Waters the prowler who earlier had buried Gail Stanley alive in the sand. And the reason Captain Friday knew it was Walters was that the prowler had left damp footsteps on the bedroom floor and on the wet sand outside the window. And those footprints were Andrew Walters. And the thing with the swollen face, dead eyes, and a rope around its neck had Carmel Ruiz in his possession. Andres Ruiz, cousin of Carmel, is beside himself over the disappearance of Carmel. He is pacing the floor in Captain Friday's summer cottage. But I will go crazy. I will kill myself if anything has happened to my Carmel. If you do not find her, Senor Captain, I will go mad. Now, take it easy, Andres. Sit down, will you? You get on my nerves pacing up and down like that. But Captain Friday... Now look here, Andres, be reasonable. There's no use running around the country. We'd never find her that way. If you'll just hang on to yourself for a minute... You have idea? Well, I might have if you'd be quiet for just two minutes. Oh, in two minutes I will be mad. I do not know what I do now. Well, look here, Andres. I, I can't tell you how sorry I am. I haven't the faintest idea of what happened to Carmel. Well, you have shown very bad nature, Senor Stanley. I do not know what to believe about you. I don't blame you for saying that. It's true, and I know it, and I'm sorry. Well, for why have you done all these things? Say bad things. Try to run away. I don't know. I'm always pulling something I'm sorry for afterwards, but... Look here, Andres, if there's anything I can do to help save Carmel, I'll go the limit to do it. And he means it too, Andres. Yes, I think he does. Hey, look, everyone, I've got a hunch. I'm going out for three or four minutes, and you four stay here. Don't one of you dare move out of this room. Not out of the room? Not a move. Like company, Captain? No, not this time, Dr. Croft. I've got to travel fast. Anyway, I'd like you to stay here with the others. You'll all be safer. But what about your own safety, Captain? Now, don't worry, I'll be okay. Now, mind now, don't even leave the room. Where do you suppose he's going? Oh, if he will only bring back Carmel. Oh, I hope he does. I feel we should be doing something. Oh, see, but Captain Friday said to wait here. It's all nonsense sitting around in one room when we might be out searching. You are nervous too, Senor Doctor. Oh, it is enough to make everybody crazy. But still, Captain Friday said he had an idea. Yes, but supposing it is wrong, Miss Stanley. You're right there, Andres. Theories are very dangerous things to work with that is apt to be wrong as right. And still, I have very great faith in this, Captain. Oh, yes, we must believe in him. 
We'd be lost if we didn't. Well, who else have we to turn to? Well, there's Dr. Croft here. I'm afraid I'm not much of a detective, Stanley. I tell you, it is not possible that my Uncle Andrew Walters took Carmel. It is not possible. He's dead. The dead have done a number of impossible things lately, I'm afraid, Andres. Oh, I know, but I see with my own eyes the walls of the morgue fall down on all three bodies. They are pinned under hundreds of tons of stone and mortar. That's a wonder you and the captain weren't killed. Well, we would have been if we had not seen the walls falling and running to the ice-cold room, which protected us a little from the falling stones. A remarkable escape, Andres. Oh, but what I am interested in is about these bodies. They are buried deep under the walls, and, and yet one of the dead men have carried off Carmel. Open the door. Somebody open the door, quick. Oh, it is the captain. I will open. I will open it. Carmel! Carmel! You found Carmel! Oh, my, get out of the way, Andres. Can't you see she's tied hand and foot? Is she hurt, Captain? Is she hurt? Oh, no. Here. Let me put her on the lounge. Here is knife, senor. Cut her loose. Here, here. For the love of Mike, Andres, get out from underfoot. She is not hurt. Tell me she's not hurt. Oh, Carmel, please, you mustn't cry like that. You mustn't. Uh, there. Here, Andres, take the knife and cut her legs free. Si, si, senor. I will do anything. Oh, Carmel, but it is good you are safe. Poor kid. Get back, you folks. Don't crowd in so close around her. Here, Captain. Let me give her a couple of these tablets. She mustn't go on like that. Will they quiet her? I think they will. Here, child, swallow these and then take a sip of water. <laughs> Is there anything I can do, Dr. Croft? No, I think not. She's just highly wrought up. She'll grow quiet in a few minutes. Here, Andres, you sit here beside her. She was calling for you when I found her. She... She was calling for me? Oh, senor. She, she was calling for me. Oh, never again will I let you out of my sight. You know, Gail, that, that Andres isn't such a bad fellow either. I knew he was in love with Carmel the moment I first saw them together. But, Captain, where was Carmel? Where did you find her? Well, if you've examined this cottage closely, you'll notice that the backs of the closets have not been finished off. You can go through the back in among the floor studdings and rafters. Oh, yes. Yes, I noticed that. Well, my old aunt used to put junk that she didn't want to throw away back in them. I found Carmel stuffed back among the joists and studdings of her own closet. Oh, oh but... No. What made you look there? Well, then you must have carried her through the back window and, and around to the front door. Yes, I did, all right. But what for? Did it to throw our would-be murderer off the trail. Off the trail? You, you mean he's around here? Maybe, maybe not. But why didn't we hear her crying? She was gagged. Captain, what made you think of looking in the house for her? Uh, it would have been too dangerous to take her out. He might have been spotted. Besides, the tracks he left when he went away showed he wasn't carrying anything. No, I remember it, Captain. That was the same clue you got when we were hunting Miss Stanley here, when she was buried in the sand. Well, you'd think even a dead body would learn not to make the same mistake twice in a row. And so you figured out the body must be in the house. How did you happen to think of looking in the girl's own wardrobe? Well, I figure he'd probably be working fast, not knowing how long I'd be gone. Besides, Dr. Croft, you were tied up in the other room. Might get free at any minute. Yes. Quite natural when you stop to think of it. And so, uh, from force of necessity, you figured he'd hide her in the handiest place. Mm -hmm. Force of necessity and craftiness. He'd hardly expect us to look so near the scene of the crime for her. Oh, uh, Andre seems to have Carmel quieted. Perhaps we can talk to her now. We'll have a try, anyhow. And Carmel, you're not going to cry anymore, eh? Oh, we're going to be very happy, you and I. Aren't you, Keith? Well, Carmel, you don't look like the same young lady I carried in a few minutes ago. Oh, but, senor, she understands now that she's going to be very happy for the rest of her life. Yeah? Uh, look here, Carmel, you feel like talking? Yes. Please, you will not bring back bad memories? I'm sorry, Andres, but we've got to get all the information we can. Please, Andres, I don't mind. If you'll sit beside me. Oh, nothing in the world could make me move. Okay. Now then, tell us what happened. I, I was asleep when, when something touched me, and, and I opened my eyes and... and oh, please, Cap. I'm all right, Andres. And there was a horrible face looking down at me. It didn't look like it was alive. And there was a rope around its neck. Oh, it is a monstrous thing. What did you do? When he saw it was awake put his hand over my mouth. I tried to scream, but I couldn't. He 
held me so tight, I fought just as hard as I could. Oh, my poor Carmel. And, and one of his fingers slipped into my mouth. And I bit down on it just as hard as I could. You, you, bit, you bit his finger, huh? Yes. And when he jerked it away, there was blood on his hand. Captain, a dead man doesn't bleed. No, he doesn't. Oh, no. Yes, that's just what I was thinking. What then, Carmel? Well, he put a cloth around my face so I couldn't see or scream after he tied me up so I couldn't move. He carried me someplace. But if it is life, man... Captain, my uncle could not be alive and dead at the same time. Never heard of it being done before. But if there's a live man mixed up in this thing, we ought to get after him. Yes, but where would we look? I think that'll be easy. You mean, you know where he is? I have a hunch I can walk out that door into the hallway and march our friend Andrew Walters back in here in jig time. Oh, no. What are you saying? You mean he's listening to us on the other side of the door? I have a hunch he's been listening, all right. Oh. Dr. Croft, you mind coming with me? Not at all. You armed? No, but... Never mind. I don't think we'll have much trouble. Now, you folks stay here. And I mean right where you are. I'll be back in two minutes with Andrew Walters. Dead or alive? Captain Friday has promised the four young people, Andres and Carmel Ruiz and Gail and Martin Stanley, that he would return in two minutes with Andrew Walters, the man who was found hanged in his home. The eyes of the four are fixed on the doorway as it opens slowly and cautiously. <gasps> That's him! That's Andrew Walters! Oh, he's the one that choked me. The rope around his neck. Oh, oh no! All right, go on in. I've got a get in your back oh, and I won't hesitate Take him to away! Use. Take him away. It's all right. I have his hands cuffed together behind him. He can't hurt you. But who is it? Hey, don't you who? see? Don't you see? He's got on one of those rubber face masks. Oh, no. What is this? Captain Friday, where's Dr. Croft? Don't you know? What? Captain, it is Dr. Croft behind that mask. Oh, uh -huh, sure. Have a look. Uh, Captain Friday, would you mind removing that rope from around my neck? It has an ugly feeling. Now, see here, Doctor, I'm giving you your choice. Do you tell him or do I? Why? It will make a very pleasant story. I think I should like to tell it. All right, go ahead. My dear nieces and nephews. What's that? What did you say? For why do you call us nieces and nephews? Because it happens due to certain biologic and sociological phenomena to be true. Oh, cut that stuff out. Who are you, anyway? <laughs> How very like Doc Sims you are in temperament, boy. Nuts. As to who I am, do you recall the autobiography left by Andrew Walters, alias Vance Sims? Do you recall that there was a third brother, Franklin Sims, who was murdered in the Near East? I am Franklin Sims. Right, Captain? That's right. Get along with the story, Doctor. Oh, yeah, quite right. Uh, you see, uh, that night 20 years ago, we got news that our father was dying. The night Doc Sims took Vance out and got him thoroughly intoxicated and then hit me over the head and dumped me in a nasty-smelling river. Then Doc Sims, not Andrew Walters, was the murderer. Oh, no, there was no murderer. For I crawled out of the river and foul and smelly as I was from the thick river water, I continued to live. But, but if you are who you say you are, why didn't you come back to the United States at once and claim your part of the estate? Because, my dear... For almost three years, I was so horribly ill, I spent most of my time balancing on the brink between life and death. Later, I went to Germany, and I became a medical student. And still, you didn't try to get your share of the money? My life had become a thing apart from my family and my rightful estate. I intended never to return to America. And then, about 12 years ago, everything became changed again. I became interested in certain... Biological experimentations. I spent every cent I had saved, could earn and borrow, and still I needed more. And then I remembered the great fortune which had been taken from me in America. I determined to get it back by fair means or foul. It was mine, and I determined to have it. But, senor, it was not us who had hurt Wait a minute, Andres. I returned to San Francisco under the assumed name of Dr. Jamie Croft and set up office while I got the lay of the land. When I first arrived... My brother, Doc Sims, held the entire estate. It seemed an easy matter to put him out of their way. <laughs> Enter my claim. And then I discovered that he had a niece and a nephew to whom the property would go in the case of his death. That's you, Miss Stanley, and your brother, Martin. 
And while I was trying to find some means of overcoming this difficulty, who should come on the scene but Andrew Walters? And without any fuss, he took over half the Sims estate. It took me three years to discover that he was my other brother, Vance. And then, by a bit of housebreaking and prowling, I discovered that he too had a niece and nephew whom he favoured in case of his death. They were you, Carmel, and you, Andres. Yes, go on. Well, in the meantime, I was working out a little scheme which worked rather nicely when the time came. About eight years ago, my brother, Doc Sims, died. Hey, what's that? Our uncle died eight years ago? Yes, all of eight years ago. And being on the ground at the time, I quietly buried the body and stepped into his shoes. Now, wait a minute, Doctor. I've known both you and Doc Sims for more than two years. Which says a great deal for my ability as an impersonator. Do you mean to say that you've been acting the part of two doctors for eight years? I have sufficient proof for even you, Captain Friday. But, but the body. We saw the body of Doc Sims. That, my dear, was also a plant. For the last year, I've been taking care of an old chap over in my San Francisco office. He was a nondescript without any family. But he looked remarkably like me in my role of Doc Sims. For six months, I practically made him live with narcotics and drugs, waiting for the proper time to inject him into the picture. And when Andrew Walters mellowed and sent for Andreas and Carmel to come and live with him, I knew the time was at hand. Yeah. Well, you'll have to explain that a little. Easily. My whole trouble lay in the four cousins who were to inherit the two estates. They must be gotten rid of. With all four in Holman, I believed that might be attended to. You were going to kill us all. And so when my brother Vance, or Andrew Walters, as you know him, called you two, I sent for Gail and Martin Stanley. What about this old fellow you passed off for Doc Sims? <laughs> now, Captain, I assure you I didn't kill him. The poor chap died a natural death. Take his body out of the morgue ruins, show it to any coroner. Worn out body will be the verdict. Hmm. Died mighty handy for you. Quite, but the point is he did die, and naturally. Uh, which, by the way, gave me the idea for the rest of this amusing little drama which has occurred since. And you admit that you're responsible for the movement of these bodies from the morgue? Naturally. And you admit burying Gail Stanley alive? My apology, Miss Stanley, but it was necessary to my plan. Oh, you, you must be mad. Oh, quite sane, thank you, quite sane. Uh, and, by the way, Captain... I had to rush like the deuce to get Andrew Walter's shoes back on him before you and Martin got to the morgue. But I made it all right. Yes, so I notice. And you're the guy that took a shot at me in Doc Sim's study and clubbed Captain Friday over the head. Again, my apologies. I always was a bad shot. You put us out and then took the papers out of the safe and stuck them in the pocket of your substitute, Doc Sims, and left his body where we'd find it. Exactly. Well, what for? To impress you all with the fact that dead bodies actually were on the prowl. And you leave Carmel's handkerchief in Dr. Sims' house. Why you do that? Oh, that was simply a little touch to implicate you, Andres, and to cause dissension between you and Stanley here. Nice fellow. And it was you who shot at me from the hall when we were upstairs examining Andrew Walter's room? <laughs> you know, Captain, I think that was my masterpiece. Uh, how did you do it? Why, I, I simply had the Hartley boy's body handy. When you, Carmel, and Andres were in the room, I crept upstairs. I got the body, I took a crack at Andres, I shouted, and I rolled down the stairs with a half-wit's body. Oh, oh sacrament. Startling bit of realism, eh, Captain? Dr. Croft, hmm. were, were you the one that got us to go to the refrigeration room of the morgue? I thought I had all of you that time. After knocking the captain out, I ran to the cottage and, changing my voice as much as possible, told you to go to the basement of the morgue. When you rushed in... I swung the door shut at. There you were. Please, when we liked you so much, how could you do that to us? Oh, let's not go into that, please. Well, then I set the three bodies on guard. Startling effect, eh, Captain? Oh. Then you came back and dragged me in the closet with you and locked the door. <laughs> and all the time we were breaking down the door, I had the key in my pocket. Seems to me I'm the guy that told you once that the solution to this business, once I got my hands on it, would be so simple I'd blush to think I didn't get wise to it sooner. Well, get an eyeful of me blushing. Oh, see here, Captain, you're not giving me enough credit. I admit, however, I made a couple of mistakes. 
One of them was forgetting to turn off the light in the morgue. If I hadn't been in such a hurry that time, you'd never have thought of searching the morgue until it was too late. See here, Doctor. How did you fix it so that the halfway took a shot at me and then fell down the stairs? Simple. I braced the body against the handrail and hooked a gun in his coat. Fastened the trigger to the door with a piece of wire. Presto, when the door opened, the gun exploded and the body lunged down the stairs. Mm-hmm. Good thing for me you didn't allow for the up jerk of the muzzle of the revolver when it went off. <laughs> I told you I didn't know much about guns, Captain. After all, I... I'm a medical man, not a gangster. But why did you kill the half-wit boy? Surely he didn't... Oh, that I know nothing about. You didn't kill the boy? Please. Please, he did not. I... I did not know it until the senor captain tell me, but... It was I who did this thing. Andres! Uh -huh. Andres, you didn't! Oh, please, Carmel, it was a most horrible mistake. It's like this. Remember the night you kids saw the skeleton on the beach and Andres shot at it? Well, the skeleton was the half-wit boy, and Andres killed him. His father had given him several rubber masks and some luminous paint for Halloween, and the foolish boy continued to use it to amuse himself. The boy's father knows all about this now. And uh, that, by the way, is where I got that mask you recently saw on my face. I found it lying outside the morgue. Dr. Croft, what was your idea in blowing up the morgue? Oh, Captain, you cannot imagine how uneasy a person grows having a bloodhound like yourself on his trail. I grew more and more certain that you were beginning to suspect the truth. So, I laid the trap and got you and Andres off on a pretext of hearing a woman scream. Well, I'm glad I knocked you over the head. Too bad I didn't do a better job of it. <laughs> I get your point exactly, Martin. The real sim spirit. Oh, I never want to hear that name again. You see, you made your big mistake, Doctor, when you kidnapped Carmel here. I was plain crazy. Yeah, you're, you're, you're right, Captain. But I was getting rather upset. Things were growing a little too warm. You'll have to excuse it on that basis, I'm afraid. You see, I'd stolen Andrew Walter's shoes again before I set the trap in the morgue. But I must confess, I entirely forgot to make deep tracks in the sand when I left. Ah. Juicy thoughtless of me. Yes. So was that stunt of hiding your mask and rope and shoes in your medicine case after you'd finished with them. Undoubtedly. Oh, I can see a number of things I'd do differently if I were going to do it over again. You know, one thing puzzles me, though. How did you get the body of this substitute Doc Sims on the beach? <laughs> Captain, I don't know if you realize it, but I angled like the juice to get you to bring me over to Holman on this particular weekend. Yeah, now that I think of it, you were plenty eager to come. Well... I got the invitation. The day we were to come over, I took the body in my launch and I brought it over. The natives seldom walk on the beach, so I felt perfectly safe in leaving it there for a few hours. I got back to San Francisco just in time to meet you. Then we came over together. Oh. I presume you know we've got enough attempted murder charges against you to keep you behind bars for life. But you're not going to use them, are you, Captain? You think not? Drag these children through the mire of prosecuting their own uncle? Bring all this family history to light? Oh, no. We don't want to do that. I, I couldn't bear it. Exactly. That's just too bad. Now, look, Captain Friday, haven't we gone through enough? Are you folks crazy? I think the police department would like to have a little talk with Dr. Croft. As a matter of fact... Come in. Hey, for crying out loud, Cappy, I've been... Oh, excuse me. I didn't know you had company. Oh, <laughs> that's all right, Skip. These people are all friends. Yeah? Well, you sure got some nice friends, boss. Mm. Now, this is Gail Stanley. Miss Stanley, my right-hand man, Skip Turner. Hello, Skip. Howdy, Miss Stanley. And uh, Miss Carmel Ruiz. Oh, how do you do, Mr. Turner? Miss Ruiz. Well, now, ain't that funny? You know, I think I remember meeting you before, Miss Ruiz. Um, uh, Carmel? Wasn't it down Skip. at... Skip. Uh, huh? Did you come all the way from San Francisco just to meet my guests? Huh? Oh, hey, I almost forgot. We got an important job down south. Down south? Where down south? Hollywood. Here, here's a telegram. Who's it from? Don't say. Go ahead and read it. Hmm. Meet me at Maggie's Intimate Drinking Salon, Sunset Strip, Hollywood, tonight at 8. Signed, A Desperate Sister. And what is this, a gag? Gag? I just got a phone call from the same gal, and she wired us $1,000 expense money. Why did she phone? I'm just be sure we'd be there at 8 o'clock tonight. Hey, look, we just got time to catch a 5 p.m. plane south. That's why I hustled over here. 
I got the ticket. She must be desperate. Come on, we ain't got no time to lose, boss. Okay, Skip, we'll look into it. Oh, by the way, you got your handcuffs? Why, sure. Why? Yeah, just slip them on Dr. Croft here. We'll drop them off at the Hall of Justice. You bet you. Here you are, fella. And the other one. There you go. Nice little charm bracelet. Well, see here, Captain Friday, I can afford Save to... Save it for the judge, Dr. Croft. He loves those little stories. The rest of you check in with the police in San Francisco. I'll see you as soon as I get back from Hollywood. All right, let's go. Yeah. Oh, uh, Carmel, if uh, you should happen to be in Hollywood in the Come next on, few Skip. days... Come on, Skip. There's a desperate sister waiting for us in Maggie's intimate drinking salon. Let's get moving. So Captain Friday and his operative Skip Turner are headed for Maggie's intimate drinking salon on the Sunset Strip in Hollywood. The telegram said to be there at 8 o'clock tonight and was sent by one who signed herself a desperate sister. Tune in next week at the same time for this newest adventure thriller by Carton E. Morse, titled, You'll Be Dead in a Week. You are listening to Adventures by Morse.